You know who's cool? Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan is a kung fu action movie star from Hong Kong and is generally a pretty silly performer. He's also a singer, action choreographer, martial artist, comedian, screenwriter, entrepreneur, rock star, engineer, marksman, vigilante, lion tamer, construction worker, communist dictator, fascist dictator, drug dealer, spiritual leader, and serial killer. Yeah, pretty talented guy. Jackie Chan became well known to American audiences particularly from the 1998 buddy cop movie Rush Hour opposite Chris Tucker and he's one of the only actors who could match well with that man. Anyway, since Jackie became this mainstream kung fu action star to the American audience, studios wanted to cash in on his image, so thus the idea for Jackie Chan Adventures was born. Now, celebrities having shows made about their lives isn't uncommon. Examples that fit into the time frame I talk about are Everybody Hates Chris and Class of 3000. Everybody Hates Chris was about Chris Rock's life in PG sitcom form, while Class of 3000 is very much a fantasy for Andre 3000 marketed towards children. Jackie Chan Adventures takes some elements from both these types of setups, though more towards the latter. This show is about a fictionalized version of Jackie Chan, not voiced by Jackie Chan, but by a voice impersonator named James Sia, who speaks English much better than Mr. Chan. I'm sure the booty is booby trapped, so don't touch anything. I was doing stunts so many years, the audience see the actor or the bad guy, they do all the stunts, then the audience is crap. This Jackie is an archaeologist who finds ancient artifacts. Alright, Jackie Chan's fantasy is to be Indiana Jones. Hey, that's cool. I'd want to be Indiana Jones too. To make Jackie more relatable, he's not a famous celebrity in this show as well, which is nice. Not like that Hannah Montana stuff, am I right? The intro to this show tells us quite a bit. It has a smooth guitar riff with a small amount of Asian flair. This is such a great intro with a memorable theme song that puts us into the show immediately. There is action that is featured within the show where all the characters are visible and there is fight choreography like a wuxia film. That is, when they aren't fighting a huge demon. To ease ourselves into the plot, let's start with the pilot episode. So, Jackie is with a group of friends in some castle ruins. They dodge the Indiana Jones traps and get a shield. Then we find that Jackie is being watched by two groups. One led by a blonde dude in a flamboyant green suit, and another by some bald guy. We are then introduced to Jackie's uncle, who will only be referred to as Uncle for the duration of the show. He owns an antique shop in San Francisco. Also, Uncle, he's a racial stereotype. That was kind of funny as a kid, not so much now. You did not make coffee this morning! Coffee is the only thing keeping Uncle's ancient heart beating. You want dead Uncle? No? Then you make coffee! Anyway, Jackie meets his niece he never knew he had, Jade, who turns out to be a bit of a troublemaker. So, three goons come in and Jackie has an extended fight scene with them. Then the bald guy from before abducts our hero. Jackie recognizes this man as Captain Augustus Black, who runs a secret organization to fight evil under the government. Clancy Brown plays Captain Black, who is white. Whenever he appears, I think of Lex Luthor. No, seriously, look at him and listen to him. The voice actor does his voice exactly the same. We are aware that you recently acquired an artifact in Bavaria. Why does everyone know this? Jackie. <laughs> the people! This is all their fault! And they're going to burn for it. Burn! The organization that Captain Black leads is called Section 13, who stands against a powerful criminal organization called the Dark Hand. Despite the fact that the leader of the Dark Hand, Valmont, is a wealthy man with connections to the global criminal underworld, he rarely seems to have more than four enforcers at a time. We meet another character, Toru Adachi, a police officer who comes off as a nice person, always taking orders from Dosh- Oh, my mistake, wrong character. This is Toru, he's a stoic Japanese man, and the big man of the bad guys. So, we learn Valmont is working for a statue of a dragon named Shen Du, who can summon an army of shadow warriors for some reason that's not explained for a long time. In the first season of the series, the heroes and villains clash for animal-based talismans that grant a particular superpower. Some are cool, like the ox gives you Hulk strength, and others are kinda lame, like the sheep talisman, which only gives you a non-combative skill, which in this case is astral projection. So, we spend the entire first season looking for the talismans. The villains want to use them to revive Shen Du. Basically, the structure of the show in a season-wide perspective is that some events happen, but mostly Jackie and his friends go looking for a set of magical artifacts against the villain team. The plot mainly comes from being eased in from the first episode of the season and concluded in the last few episodes. Actually, some viewers have compared this show to another kids WB Saturday morning cartoon that came out later, Shaolin Showdown. I do see similarities. Both these shows are built around some Asian ideals that the Western world is familiar with and has racially stereotyped characters for the express purpose of appealing to little kids. Shaolin Showdown had a steep tone curve, which means it started out more cartoonish than Jackie Chan, but Shaolin Showdown also got much darker than Jackie Chan, while Jackie Chan Adventures stays consistent. Which is a good way to describe it. Consistent. Jackie Chan Adventures is a low-risk show. Nothing about it is graphic, cerebral, or particularly artsy. But we don't need it to be. And don't really expect it to be. It was traded as a Saturday morning cartoon to cash in on the image of a quirky kung fu movie star. And for that type of show, it's pretty good. 
What this show got right that Shaolin Shodown gets wrong is that the protagonist, Jackie, is very likable, like the actor he's based on, and it captures his quirks, the way he acts, even the way he fights in his movies perfectly. That's probably because Jackie was involved in the production of this show quite a bit, seeing that he appears at the end of each episode to answer the questions of children. There's even a running gag where he tries to stop people who attack his uncle's shop from breaking the fragile antiques, ripped right from Rush Hour. Of course, if you don't like Jackie Chan as a performer, this character might annoy you, and that might ruin the show for you. However, if you don't like Jackie as a performer, you don't really have a reason to watch this series. As for the other characters, Uncle is kind of dull and Jade is somewhat annoying, but not entirely useless. She's just kind of there to give the kids watching the show someone to relate to. Then there are the secondary characters, like a burglar lady Jade looks up to named Viper, a masked wrestler guy named El Toro Fuerte, and is more useless than Jade's sidekick Paco. Remember what I said about racial stereotypes? These side characters are just kind of there for certain episodes. There are other villains as well, whereas Valma is just an evil Englishman who would twirl his mustache if he had one. He just completely sucks compared to Shen Du. He tries to look badass even though the only thing he does is take orders and act like a moron. We also have Hak Fu, a comedic villain who is the largest threat of Valmont's enforcers in the second season, but he's only briefly introduced in the first season. He's a hammy character and I thoroughly enjoy him. Plus, he shouts metaphorical names of attacks involving an animal performing an action. Shaolin Showdown went to use that in Chase Young. The art style of the show also has a faux anime look going for it, with large eyes and some characters like Jade having cute little noses. The lead designer, Jeff Matsuda, is a Japanese American after all, so that may be why. Following the success of anime in the United States from Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z, this art style became popular throughout the decade in our shows. It's featured in shows such as The Batman, the 2003 version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Avatar The Last Airbender, and Teen Titans. Actually, Matsuda was heavily involved in the show The Batman as well, which I may need to talk about one day. I guess I should talk about the plot since it's very prominent in this series. The entire first season is spent with Valmont sending out his enforcers to find talismans for Shen Du. Jackie often gets into a fight with the enforcers and the Shadow Ninjas. Throughout the course of the season, Jackie's team generally gets the talismans. Then all the talismans are brought to the Dark Hand at the climax of the season, by the dark half of Jackie Chan created by the Tiger Talisman, which does that by splitting you. Then the season finale is the struggle against Shen Du. Valmont orders Toru to attack when Shen Du betrays Valmont on the promise of riches. However, attacking the demon with established superpowers seems unwise. Need I remind you that I possess the power of levitation? and super strength. Fine. Treasure's yours. Toru goes to join Jackie's team now that he's got fed up with Valma and the stakes skyrocket. Since it is revealed that Shendu plots to desolate all of Asia with an army of dragons. Actually, that sounds pretty awesome. The dragon's part, not the genocide. Shendu has to be defeated by having key talismans ripped out of him through the use of a magical enchanting potion from Uncle that just lets you do that. Captain Black also suggested what I would suggest if I see a giant bipedal dragon, that is, use multiple bazookas on it. Valmont also takes the time to try to rob Shendu of his treasure from under his snout. This is a stunningly stupid idea. What the hell's wrong with Valmont? Well anyway, Jackie rips out the talisman that gives Shendu animation, and Jade brutally murders the demon by obliterating him when he's a statue, causing all the riches to fade to ash. I wonder if all this violence is having a negative effect on Jade. There's also a season sequel hook where Uncle mentions that because Shendu is destroyed in this world, a greater evil can fill the void. Wait, what? We then move on to the second season, which is very much a continuation of the first season. Shendu goes to the nether realm where he meets his seven other demon siblings who generally represent an element but can also represent locations such as the moon or sky. Shendu is tortured by his siblings until he develops a plan to possess Jackie so he can bring his siblings into the world. Meanwhile, on Earth, the Dark Hand goes and uses the talismans left behind at the end of the previous season to rob a bank, with Hak Fu now being a permanent member of the villain team. During a fight, Valma and Shendu both see Jackie Chan and charge towards him. Valma, even using his element of surprise, decides not to cut Jackie in half with his high-tech weaponry, but instead kicks Jackie off the cliff, and then gets possessed by Shendu who is then forced to operate with Valmont's body for a good portion of the season. The conflict of the season is Shendu trying to bring each of his comrades into this world through the use of a magical portal box at the location of a certain portal for each demon, and Jackie's team tries to stop him. The talismans are then thrown in and the wuxia action is basically gone at this point in favor of a different kind of violence, less hand-to-hand -hand violence and more talisman fantasy violence, thus showing the series has evolved beyond its original boundaries, even though I kind of prefer the kung fu fighting. 
The demons are all weak to a certain item representing the means in which they were first defeated, and that's how the J-Team stops any demon that gets out. Eventually, they seal Shen Du back into the netherworld, where he's tortured by siblings again for his failure. We then move to the next part of the arc. Shen Du is given another chance to go back and possess Jackie to go find something called the Book of Ages. It's a magical item where, if you write in it, you can alter history. This has got to be one of the most nonsensical plot devices I've ever seen, even in a cartoon. Actually, this is the part of the story with the most plot holes. Oh boy, this is gonna be fun. If you're like me, you start asking questions about this mystic book that's out of place even in this show. It appears to just be in a cave in Australia without any form of protection. It just kind of writes itself. You know, when I imagine a book that can alter reality, I imagine that guy from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade who is bound to eternally protect this magical artifact. Now my next question is, why is this plan B? What is the advantage of bringing in one demon at a time when you could just, oh, I don't know, rewrite history? The demons do seem to object initially, but are convinced rather easily when they realize how bored they are in the nether. Why didn't Shendu propose this from the beginning? If our little dragon just possessed Valmont and immediately went to the Book of Ages, he would have easily rewritten history, and no one in the J-Team would have known of his return. Nothing would have stopped him. So, Shendu succeeds in tempering with history, but Jade, having ripped part of the book containing her off, keeps all her memories. Oh shoot, we have to root for her to save the world? Come on, she's about as useful as Pan from... That one show we will never name. So, Shendu and his siblings now rule the world, and no one else remembers the old world except Jade, who has to round everyone up again and prepares to use the items that banish the demons to take them down one by one. Since the plot has collapsed on itself in absurdity already, I might as well nitpick this. If the demon sorcerers were never sealed, how do the items still affect them? And if these items are still effective, why wouldn't the demons destroy every single one of the items that they are vulnerable to in order to become invincible, seeing that they already rule the world? Well anyway, Jade rescues her old team and she knocks out four of the demons in about nine minutes of screen time. These antagonists are irritatingly incompetent. The four remaining demons wait for the heroes in Australia while guarding the book. I, I, I got an idea guys, how about you go up to the book and erase them from history? I know that won't stop you from getting Jade, but seriously, it's a step in the right direction. So the Jade team, which also includes El Toro and Viper, fight the demons with the talismans until Jade manages to get a hold of the book to fix everything. In the course of one episode, all eight of the demon sorcerers were banished with the normal items that become kryptonite to them. These supposedly ultimate villains kinda suck. Why are we so scared of them again? Was it the glowing red eyes? Okay, I'm finished picking apart the least sensical story arc that squandered what was an awesome idea with a badly thought out plot device and a weak ending. At least had cool action, which is all I needed to love it as a kid. So, what happens now? It's about this point that the writers decide to give us some filler, in other words, unrelated adventures, like Toru's mother comes to visit, or Jackie Chan fights a vampire. Then there are some other filler episodes not in chronological order set in the first season but aired in the second season. This will be fine, except this is two thirds of the second season. If this show didn't start with a continuous narrative, this wouldn't be so painful. It's important to establish what the show is early on. Also, important note, NO ONE WANTS TO WATCH FILLER! Let's use anime as an example. No one wanted to see the episodes of Naruto where Naruto goes on some random missions to go deal with characters created by studios and not artists that barely fit into the set world. Or no one really wanted to watch the Garlic Jr. saga of Dragon Ball Z. You wanna know why? There's no dramatic tension in a show that was built around dramatic tension. The people who realize the episodes exist waste time and nothing is allowed to alter the status quo of the story, those people get bored. This would have been a lot less jarring if they simply started with the random adventures and moved into the Dark Hand and Shen Du. If you add drama to a series that starts with none, it works, it's more natural. If you had it, but take it away for 26 episodes after 26 episodes, most of which had tense moments, then it fails. That was something that Shaolin Showdown got right. Unrelated adventures makes the show more character driven, and we're seeing them develop in different situations instead of a focus being on a story. But it doesn't work too well for this because the characters are not well defined. Jackie reflects the actor in his movies. His mannerisms never leave that realm, which probably helped the show and character back quite a bit. Jade exists for kid appeal, and I always found her kind of annoying. Uncle is the same racial stereotype joke over and over that's occasionally funny. Sometimes we see his background with Jackie, and those episodes are nice. Toru actually gets more development, but his role is a bit too minor compared to the other three main characters. The sudden shift of nothing happening turned me away from the show for a long time until I caught episodes of the fifth season airing on Cartoon Network years later. So, I do not have a childhood perspective of the third and fourth seasons, as I had to go back to watch these episodes. In the third season, we have a villain named Daolong Wong, a dark chi wizard, notably voiced by James Hong. If you walked in at the start of the season, you'd have no idea who he is. He was introduced in one of the late filler episodes of the second season, and came back twice that season. That's right, a filler villain that got promoted to an arc villain. 
To ease ourselves into the season, we have an episode where the Enforcers and Valmar... You three will break into Section 13 and steal the talismans. <laughs> oh, they got a new voice actor. This new guy doesn't even sound remotely like the last guy. It seems like they just told the new voice actor to make him sound like a slimy British man because surely the British are all evil. So anyway, the Dark Hand make plans to steal Shen Du's talismans while Dalong Wong tries to do so as well. In a clash, Dalong Wong is about to get the talismans and Jackie vaporizes the artifacts. But then we are educated about the law of conservation of energy as the power within the talismans cannot be destroyed and go bind to existing animals. Dalong Wong takes not Valmont's enforcers and makes them his slaves with his magic. That's each episode. The J-Team races against Daolong Wong and the transformed version of the Enforcers to obtain the energy emanating from an enchanted animal. The antics still fit within the realm of the show. Since the show is not known for developing its characters, I guess I'll talk about Daolong Wong and his role as the big bad of the season. His motivations are not clear, he just wants to spread evil or something. His plans don't threaten the fate of the world on the same scale as Shen Du. Alright, a smaller scale story is something we might want to welcome. More of a throwback to the early first season before Shen Du came and elevated the stakes. We don't want to be putting the world in constant danger, otherwise the idea might lose some meaning. Or even become a joke. You fools! You don't know what you've done! You have unleashed the greatest evil the world has ever seen. Huh, sounds like end of the world time. Again, no. It is far worse than that. The story's tone is much lighter than the last two story arcs. Mr. Wong's design's pretty cool too. Heterochromia, white anime hair, mouths on his hands to absorb chi. So what's wrong with him? Even though he's got these cool powers, somehow he succeeds less than the Dark Hand did in the first season. Wong is also kind of a moron. To illustrate this, let's just skip to the chronological season finale. Daolong Wong wants the dragon talisman combustion energy, but there are no dragons left in existence. So he makes a deal with Shen Du and brings the dragon back to life. Hey, Daolong, the problem with making a deal with a demon with a history of betraying his partners in crime is... The power of combustion belongs to me! Yeah, that'll happen. So, Shen Du dominates the season finale, looking for his powers, and he reminds us of how much of a better villain he is. Wong reluctantly assists our heroes in sealing Shen Du into a statue again, bringing the talismans back into existence. Also, there are a few filler episodes. They fit into the Liar Tone season better and don't run for too long like last season. So, on to season 4. Daolong Wong and the Dark Hand try to get out of prison by summoning the Shadow Khan. You know, the ninja army Shen Du could summon before. But Mr. Wong summons what looks like the head of an anthropomorphic tiger. This is Tarakudo, and he's going to be our villain this season. He is Lord of the Shadow Khan. His existence is hinted at in Season 2 where Jay got a tattoo that allowed her to control the Shadow Khan, and the tattoo looks just like Tarakudo. This time the item we're looking for is Oni Masks, which when worn make you evil, stronger, and allow you to summon the Shadow Khan. If Tarakudo manages to get all 9 of the masks, he can cover the whole earth in Shadow Khan. He recruits the Dark Hand again, and instead of enslaving them, he actually treats them pretty cool. Alright, these are all steps in the right direction. Tarakudo actually makes his goals clear, and the stakes are raised from the previous season. His treatment of the Enforcers being different, as in much nicer than Shen Du and Daolong Wong, allows him to form his own traits, and not feel like he's reusing the ones of the previous villains. Despite this, there's an overall feeling of the series running on fumes. They basically can't expand much more with this premise. The characters feel restricted by a lack of heart. Those of you not familiar with heart, it means how much we care about the characters. These characters are okay, albeit kinda boring. But you need stronger characters for a show to run this long. They shouldn't be stuck as caricatures and doomed to reuse their same catchphrases and jokes over and over. Anyway, let's finish this up. Section 13 gets all the masks, and apparently bringing all 9 together results in Tarakudo's generals being freed and the masks being destroyed. So, if the villain won, he wins. And if he lost, he would also win. Hey, so far he's got my favorite plan among these villains. I like Tarakudo. So the J-Team, with Viper and El Toro because why not, goes to stop the generals with what else but the talismans. Tarakudo actually notices this and stops them by trapping the team. Dang, this guy takes initiative. Gotta respect that. He actually kinda deserves to rule the earth based on how much effort he puts into this. Uncle sends Toru to find one final Oni mask to steal the Shadow Khan, the mask of Tarakudo in the Shadow Realm. Toru comes out of the Shadow Realm evil. Uncle finishes his potion and gives Tarakudo a body, which is the only form he can be defeated in. Tarakudo solos the entire J team and defeats Jackie Chan as well, but the Master of the Shadow Khan is distracted long enough for Jay to put the mask on the Shadow Lord, ending the destruction of the world, sealing the apocalypse in a mask. Alright, that's the end of Season 4. Alright, Season 5. The short version? It sucks. Oh. You want more? Okay. 
It's not quite accurate to say this season sucks, it's just there was nothing new about this season that was positive. All the new things added affected the show negatively. Since the characters are not strong enough to give each season a definition, the arcs are defined by their antagonists. So who's our villain? It's Shendu's son, Drago. Not a badass son that could do everything about as well as his father, but a crappy version of Shendu that just whines and drops lame one-liners. Close up, Drago. With pleasure. He was introduced in an episode of last season where Jade came back from the future to try to stop Drago's apocalypse and it ended with him getting imprisoned in section 13. At the beginning of this season, Drago breaks out and decides to go look for the demon chi of the other demons to absorb their powers. He turns the now retired Dark Hand Enforcers into his dragon slaves. Are you guys seeing a pattern here? A villain that was a one-shot or only a brief reference in a previous season gets promoted to Big Bad, enslaves or convinces the Dark Hand to be his minions, and in this case, transforms them. Hey, that's, that's totally a new thing you're doing there. And they go look for a set of magical artifacts, or in the case of this season and season 3, a variation of some magical force we've already dealt with. This is so lazy. Drago lets the Dark Hand off the hook after one episode, determining the Enforcers useless. I'm really starting to feel sad for our buddies Ratso, Finn, and Chow. They just kept getting captured and forcibly employed by evil mastermind after evil mastermind, albeit their last boss probably didn't make them want to join a labor union. A few episodes later, Drago replaces them with three much more unlikable characters that have stupid hip names and always talk street or something. They're actually decent fighters. Well, not really. Jackie and friends still mowed these guys down like Jedis against battle droids. So each episode of the fifth season, Drago tries to obtain our Demon Chi of the Week, and usually gets it. But he never holds on to it for more than the duration of the episode, as Uncle is always there with the spell to remove the chi. Somehow this guy has a lower success rate than the Dark Hand and Dalong Wong. Hey, Drago, I got an idea. How about you target Uncle and kill him? Or at least break his fancy demon chi storing item so you can keep your obtained energies for longer than 10 minutes after you obtain them. This isn't that hard, buddy. So right before the finale, Drago loses his fire chi as well. Okay, finale time. Drago has his minions kidnap Jackie, Uncle, and Captain Black and demands the ransom of the demon chi. Jade and Toru go to section 13 to get the chi while Toru prepares a spell that can remove the chi from Drago, which also requires a piece of Shendu. Drago's men betray him and knock their former master into the San Francisco Bay from the Golden Gate Bridge, surely killing him. Uncle then arrives and casts a spell to take the demon chi out of the Dragon Boys. Drago, surviving a 300 foot fall, then channels all the energy to himself from the sea, saying, Take a last look at this world of yours, humans, because I'm about to turn it topsy turvy and all kinds of curvy! Oh god, why? Drago has all the demon chi and the sky becomes completely red, so surely we know it must be getting epic and dark. Uncle goes to section 13 and has a chat with Shendu on how to remove the chi, which Shendu comments is impossible when they are all brought together. Shendu also offers to defeat Drago if Uncle frees the demon. Drago is understandably a tiny bit pissed that his minions turned on him, so he traps them in Earth until they break out later. Uncle is visited by the Dark Hand and Hakfu, who are looking to help out. Section 13 lays siege to the now Cthulhu-looking transformed Drago, but that goes about as well as you'd expect. And his former minions join in on the destruction, calling it fun. God, these side villains are so unsympathetic and humorless. Drago does forgive his former henchmen and gives them some demon chi to use to eliminate Section 13. Also, this finale finds a way to shoehorn in Viper, El Toro, and Paco again, because it's gotta be epic or something. I also learned that five non-superhumans are strong enough to lift a bus full of people. Final showdown time. Jade brings the talismans to the Jade team so they can fight Drago's henchmen and his newly summoned army of dragons. Uncle goes to dig out Toru and Shendu from section 13 with the former Dark Hand. Then Shendu fights Cthulhu Drago and I suddenly love this finale. I'm almost willing to take back some of the mean things I said about the season. Hakfu and the J team fight off the monsters as Drago gains the upper hand against his father. Jade has everyone give their talismans to Shendu, allowing the Papa Dragon to own Cthulhu Drago while Uncle and Toru open a portal to the netherworld to suck in Drago and his army. Drago pleads to his father for help when he's about to be sucked into the nether. Father, help me! You deserve such a fate for your disloyalty. I'm sorry, father! Please! It's a trap! Psych! But then Drago pulls them both in, and the sorcerers close the portal. The earth is restored to normal. Captain Black offers Jade a job at Section 13, which leads to our ending gag of Jackie not letting her. Also in the Netherworld, Drago and Shendu are stuck in eternal conflict. The Earth was within my grasp! You never let me have what I want! I told you not to play with your father's world! Why not? You aren't using it! You're always too busy fighting wizards! Gotta love how the last lines in the series is Drago whining to his father. 
and that's the season 5 and series finale. Overall, the season is quite a step down, but the finale did feel like a finale, even though everything was wrapped up a little too quickly and perfectly. No more talismans, no more demon chi. Wait, if Drago's from the future, then isn't there present Drago who's going to be a threat in a few years? What about Tarakudo's mask? Wait, why didn't the later villains just go after the Book of Ages? Rewrite yourself into becoming a god? This didn't appeal to anyone? No one's protecting it. You can just walk in. There's even a quill there already. You don't even have to bring a pen. While all plot nitpicking aside, the quality of this show definitely exceeded the expectation based on the reason of the series creation. That is, to use the image and our perception of Jackie Chan to sell toys, trading cards, and other collectibles to kids with the appeal of the show. As a cheap cash-in, I enjoy it way more than I should. We have moderately likable characters, a nice fantasy setting, and a very simple Saturday morning cartoon setup. I also enjoy Shen Du and Tarakudo as villains. The series definitely loses a ton of momentum with the filler stories and the fifth season, but overall, I would still say the show is a whole lot of fun. The storytelling can sometimes suck, but it's really unreasonable for me to have high expectations for something that Eris entertained Sugar High kids in the weekend mornings. After all, the reason it was made was because Jackie Chan is famous to us, not that they wanted to use the animation to tell a story. I was mostly poking fun at the plot holes. Don't take it the wrong way. I still like the series. Most of it. Now excuse me, I would like to go watch a kaiju movie now after that finale. Ooh, Godzilla Final Wars. That sounds interesting.